I'd like to ask you to turn over to Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. You know, uh, a little bit ago, we watched a brief clip of a video. It was about the historic vote of Roe versus Wade that legalized abortion in the United States. And many of you probably didn't know that, that Jane Roe uh, never actually had that abortion. Never did it. As a matter of fact, she went on to have three girls and they realized that was a great mistake and gave her heart to Jesus Christ and developed a relationship with God through Him and, and went on to actually be a, an opponent of, of abortion. And tonight let me give you a little bit about what we're not going to do. What we're not going to do in any way is, is form a political side with any party. Uh, we're on God's side. But however, what we are going to do is we're going to look at the Bible See what it says about abortion. And we're going to go with that way. While, I, while we cannot, as a church, endorse any political party, any political figure, or anything like that, however, we must stand up for morals and ethics when they present themselves in, in, in any arena. We must uh, stand up and support the biblical view boldly. If we don't, anything less would be cowardly. It is our responsibility as Christians to do this. So tonight we're going to look at abortion and see what the Bible says about it. Here's what the psalmist said. He said, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes say my substance being yet unformed. You were marvelously made. You were wonderfully made. Now there's debate about when does life actually happen. You know, I heard three pastors debating at one time and one said, well, you know, I think life begins when the child takes his or her first breath. Another person said, well, you know what, I think life begins when the child is conceived. And one other pastor said, no, you all got it wrong. Life truly begins when the kids are drawn, move out, and the dog dies. That's when life begins. <laughs> you can finally start enjoying yourself. But folks, let me tell you, when, when true life begins, we all know is, is actually not just in the first birth, but the second birth. And when you get born again and start to live for Jesus Christ. But however, the Bible is plain that God knew us as He formed us in the womb, and we are wondrously and marvelously made by Him. We are creatures of Him, fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, last week was actually Sancti uh, uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. That was last Sunday. And it really caused me uh, to meditate upon this. This issue and this aspect is, is right now a matter of great debate even in our country. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hot topic. It made me aware of what abortion is and the abomination that it is and how it's plaguing our country. I began to do some research. The Christian Life Resource website stated that there have been over 52 million abortions accounted for in the U.S. between 1973 and 2008. Now certainly there are some probably exceptions where it probably needed to be done. But now folks, we cannot make exceptions the rule. Where now everybody just wants to go and, and, and has no appreciation for the sanctity of life whatsoever and goes and gets an abortion for any reason and they use it any time their pregnancy occurs. <coughs> This article that I got this figure from was updated in 2012, but figures for the past four years were not included in it because it said that they were not yet available. Now I want to put this in perspective for you, just how many people, 52 million people are, of the babies that we know that have been aborted from 1973 to current. Let me put this in perspective for you. I did a little bit of research. That number of a baby that's been aborted since 73 is higher than the population of New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dallas, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, 
St. Louis and Atlanta combined. Of all of our major cities in America combined, and these are just the ones we have documented and does not count the surely vast number that was never recorded, probably not only ending in the child's life, but ending with the mother's as well, and some backroom shady doctor performed somewhere. It is a horrible atrocity which the blood cries out to the Lord from the ground. An entire workforce, an entire generation completely missing from our culture. So if you have those Bibles open to Jeremiah chapter 1, let's begin reading a few verses and see what the biblical view is on abortion. Not supporting any party, any person, to seeing what God says and getting on His side, understanding what the morals and ethics of the Bible are, that way when we leave here, we can not only just be Christians in church, but we can go out and live our faith by supporting our faith, standing on our faith, and acting on our faith. Amen. Beginning in verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priest who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Let's continue reading just a little bit. Then I said, Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Amen. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, Lord, as, as a body just earnestly in, in seeking you. And Lord, we know that Right now we're living in some dark days. There are issues that are surrounding our communities and our nations. And Lord, we, we know the only direction that we can turn is turning to you. Lord, let us dive into your word. We ask that you give us understanding, give us wisdom to discern what your word says. Lord, that way we can hide it in our hearts. That way we don't sin against you. We can go out in the world and apply it. And, and as Jeremiah, we can boldly profess you because the great I am is the one that sent us. Lord, let us stand boldly for you. Even under persecution, no matter what the risks are, let us always proclaim your word and stand on your word. Be with us during this time. And Lord, through this sermon, if there's anyone here that, that, that hasn't received the second birth, the second life, that Lord, they'll see the importance in the first life and the sanctity of it and be drawn to you to receive that second life of spiritual life. We'll be with us this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, right now, we, we live in what's so-called a, a God-blessed America nation. You know, everybody says, God bless you this, God bless you that. And we, we talk about how great God is. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we, we have all kinds of churches in America. And we have so many professing Christians. But I find it so ironic that out of these thousands of, of God-blessed American people, we, we have... Thousands and thousands of babies being aborted and life being snuffed out. And folks, these little babies are real people. That, that's what we got to get in our minds. It's not just a fetus. They actually have a heartbeat. They, they have a, they're breathing. They're living people. As, as he said in these words of Jeremiah, I formed you in the womb. I formed you in the womb. God's the one that does the creation. He's the one that forms these children in the womb. These are real, living people. It's not just an embryo in a sack. And, and folks, you have to appreciate the life that God creates in every 
single thing upon earth, but most assuredly His crown of creation, which is mankind itself. Amen. These people that are getting snuffed out, these little babies folks, they're, they're suffering capital punishment, but they will never receive a trial, although they are sentenced to death. They will be afforded no counsel, right to attorney, before they're killed. They will be executed in the most cruel and inhumane way that you could possibly imagine in methods that I will not even attempt to describe to you that are too graphic for our audience. My heart goes out to these. My heart goes out to them as God does also as we hear them at this moment as it even has happened probably at this time their blood cries to us from the ground. The Word of God said in Jeremiah that I formed you in the womb before I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, ordained you a prophet into the nations. What happens in that womb is a wonderful work of God. It's God forming the child. It's life, and it's life from God. That's why I want to talk to you tonight. The title of this message is Pro-Choice is Absolutely No Choice. You know, we talk about freedom of decision. We talk about it's our right to decide. Who has the right to decide who lives and who dies? You oftentimes see teenagers that they go around and, and you know they say, well, we're going all the way now. They haven't went all the way until they stand before Almighty God in judgment. That's right. yep. You see them all the time, well, if we happen to get pregnant, then we'll just go get an abortion. We'll get rid of it. We don't want it. Folks, the facts are you've already got a baby. The decision you're going to make now is not whether you're going to, you know, have it or not. You've already had it. The decision you've got to make now is whether you're going to kill it or let it live. Mm -hmm. Whether you're going to end its life or cherish its life. Those are the decisions that we're faced with now. Once it's done happen, that's why, that's why keeping ourselves pure until marriage is so important for a Christian. It's such an important factor. And I want to talk to you about the first point that we're going to discuss tonight is that abortion takes innocent life. <clears throat> the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 6. It says, The Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. Now folks, you guys are very smart and intelligent people. And I'm going to tell you that when you get into the arena of the world, and folks, this is the world we live in, and do not forget that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Mm -hmm. You can read about the Apostle Paul when he took his journeys. He, he had to face the world, and he had to stand there into their debates sometimes and listen to be able to discern. And that's why it's so important to study this Word of God. That way, when you get out into the world and you hear these matters being debated, they're not going to pull the wool over your eyes because they'll come at you with all kinds of sophisticated arguments. They'll come at you with glamorous words. They'll come at you with a, a Webster dictionary that you're going to have to be able to carry in your pocket probably and be able to discern what they're saying. But folks, when you're a Christian and you stand on that word of God, you're thinking in your heart, no matter what argument they bring to you and how good it sounds, after a while your human instincts are going to tell you there's something fundamentally wrong with what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. There's just something fundamentally wrong about taking anything's life that cannot protect itself. We are supposed to stand up for the weak, the innocent. Then how would that be right? There, there's something wrong when, when you start looking at it just from a, even a person in the world, not even as a Christian, you can see that, that taking something's life is just not right. Mm -hmm. You would call it evil, even if you didn't have to use the Word of God. It would be referenced as evil. And the second thing I want to talk to you about is this, is that abortion transgresses the golden rule. Believe it or not, the golden rule is not who has the gold makes the rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that seems to be what we, we think it is now. Folks, the golden rule, if you remember, actually is do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. Mm -hmm. Where do we get this concept of a golden rule? Do you know it's biblical? It actually is. The great sermon on the mount, the greatest sermon that was ever preached throughout history, never will be preached, preached by Jesus Christ himself. Gospel of Matthew occurs between the 5th and 7th chapter. 
In the seventh chapter, our Lord said this. He said, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Is there any parents here that would want to be killed by dismemberment? I wonder if there's any parents in the world that would want to be killed by dismemberment. Then why would we do it? If we truly live by the golden rule of, of do unto others as we want them to do unto you, then it's vital for us that we never support abortion. What about the doctors performing? How would they like to be trapped in a cell, have their bodies covered, their lungs and stomachs filled with the corrosive fluids they use to be left to convulse to death? <coughs> I was listening to Dr. Albert Moeller. He has a little newscast on in the mornings, and I listen to it every morning as I'm getting ready. And it's the, Christ, it's the world news from a Christian perspective. Very interesting. And he was describing a doctor that just recently got arrested. And this is what the doctor was doing. He was performing abortions. But he was taking the child out alive. Then killing it. And his problem was when he got arrested, they read him the indictment of what he's done because even the law still says that's illegal. He could not see anything wrong with what he was doing. He, he couldn't understand what he was doing was wrong. He, he had no sense that he had even committed a crime. Because we get desynthesized to things. Once we see them so much, it becomes the norm. Folks, do not let it become the norm. Oppose and reject death in all forms and fashions. Oppose evil. Never allow it to stand. Amen. And that's the third thing that I want to talk to you about is abortion is absolutely and fundamentally contrary to human nature. Even if you didn't know God. And most people in America, it's sad to say, they claim it and profess it, but in actuality, they have no clue who God is. Amen. They have no personal relationship with Him. It's just been trained to them somehow that, that they know the church language and they learn it and they know how to talk and they, they say that they know God but they're as far from Him as can be. Their lips profess Him but their heart's far from Him. But even them can describe and know that it's wrong that after a child is born to go ahead and take its life. But the book of Romans tells about this time that we're in. Paul, the wise Apostle Paul said this in Romans chapter 1. He said, those who are without natural affection. Natural affection is the word astrosis. And it means a lack of love and a natural affection for one's own children. Mm -hmm. Folks, abortion is contrary to even natural instincts. But see, that, that's the problem today. It is when you can have the, the, the frame of mind where you it's no different than discarding a used milk jug, then there's something that's basically broke down in human society. And the thing is, is if this thing doesn't stop here, you see, see, it always takes us farther than we want to go and keeps us longer than we want to stay. Mm -hmm. Because you see what you think now. But you think, well, you know, give them pro-choice. It, it should be a woman's decision to discern. And if we allow that, give them what they want, and then the thing will be over. We don't got to argue about it no more. It's their decision. we got free will. Here's the problem with that. It doesn't stop there. You see, next what will happen is when a child is born premature, say at six months, well, you'll, they'll start out with saying, well, now... Let's wait till nine months, and you, after it's even more than three months, you've you still got time to kill it if you want to, because it's not really been here nine months yet. It's not full term. And then once we get there, we'll go a little further. We'll go a little further. You see, because when there's something that's not a set standard that does not change what was normal today is here, and this would have been extreme, well, and as time passes now, this is normal. We go extreme over here, so we keep taking steps and keep going and keep going. It's a slippery slope that keeps sliding down. And you can see, as society continues to do this, folks, the danger is that the church, because we are not of the world, but still living in the world, that we're going to become used to this ourselves and have a danger of adapting to it. 
That's why we have to stay so sharp on our toes and refuse and reject it. And not just reject it in a form where we're passive and we come to church and yeah, we say we're against it and, and maybe we sit at our houses and we don't do enough. Folks, it comes a time you've got to stand up and say, I, I'm against this. You've got to do everything you can do that's in your power to reject it. Whether that is go and, and, and whatever person is running that you feel supports the most biblical view on these areas, you go and that's who you support. Or whatever it is you do, organizations that support these women, let me tell you, they're going through traumatic trauma. These are people that have to be ministered to. And, and as a church, we can't sit by, or as Christians, how do we deal with the people that's had abortion? How do we deal with the people that's done the, the unnatural things as Paul talks about here? He says, without natural affection. In Romans chapter 1, Paul also addresses some other groups that we're facing right now. Homosexuality. Legalized homosexuality marriages all across America. Mm -hmm. they, they've traded the, the natural desires for the unnatural. Matter of fact, in a lot of countries, they've made it illegal to preach Romans chapter 1. Me just mentioning it like I'm doing right now, you'd be visiting me at the Case County Jail. I hope you bring me some bologna sandwiches. Yep. <laughs> that's where I'd be. If we were in a lot of other countries, it would be considered a hate speech. Mm -hmm. The folks, right's right and wrong is wrong, and woe to the man who calls evil good and good evil. Because here's what's happening. The world is transgressing farther and farther away from God. And we must be so leery about ourselves and not getting on that slope with them. And making sure that we stay with the biblical doctrines. There's many churches now that ordain homosexual pastors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As an abomination to God. But how do we? Here's the question now, though. Some application for it. There's no sense in giving us a bunch of information for no application. How do we treat those that are homosexual? How do we treat those that are for abortion? How do we treat those that have had an abortion? Treat them with love. <coughs> treat them with the love of Christ. We do unto others, we have them do unto us. We don't render evil for evil. We pray for them. <coughs> We love the people, but remember to always hate the sin. You see how detrimental? You, you've seen in the video that this woman, she said the greatest mistake in her life was when she got this thing passed. These people are hurting. And though deep down inside they're still created by God, they were still fearfully and wonderfully made too. And inside they know what they've done and the guilt of their own conscience and conviction is still weighing upon them. See, the only people that might have Holy Spirit convictions is Christians, but everybody has conscience. Because there's a difference between Holy Spirit conviction and your conscience. Now your conscience can get to a point where it just becomes completely numb. And then that might be a point where you turn it over to a reprobate mind but we pray for them that their conscience that can still be seared. That they can still feel when they've done wrong. And if they can, there's still hope for them. There's still hope that we can pray for them. Still hope that we can show them the love of Christ by not just what we speak and standing up for our actions in political agendas or, or activist movements and where we voice our opinion. But folks, the most importantly is showing by our actions through love and ministering to those. I praise God for whatever person it was that took the time out, that decided he wasn't going to hate somebody just because they committed a sin. He wasn't going to hate somebody because they're choosing to do a sin. He decided to love someone and only hate their sin. And show them the love of Christ that he was willing to bring that lady, that Jane Roe lady, to the Lord. Minister to her and introduce her into a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, that's the only way we're going to change. That's right. You're not going to change these things by just going and voting in some political candidate. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. You're not going to change these things by donating all of your resources and time and creating enough pregnancy resource centers where we cover America with. Not to say that those things aren't needed. Those things are bad. They are. They're needed. They're good. We need to be voting in people that have biblical views and will stand on. 
and not compromise. Men of integrity. We need places where women get into stress because not everybody has the luxury of growing up in a Christian home or having a church family. A lot of these young ladies are on their own and facing abuse and, and some of these situations and they've undergone these things. But folks, what will change people is the only thing that can change people and that's the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what we must always be ministering about and telling about. The love of Jesus Christ that He loved you before you loved Him. Remember the song we just sung a minute ago? That's why I love the, the theology that's behind the songs that we sing. He loved us before we loved Him. See, God still loves those people. He still sees potential in them. And that's how we should see every single person in this world is either they're a brother or a sister in Christ or they are a potential brother or sister in Christ. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. No grief that He cannot heal. No guilt that He cannot pardon with His mercy and His grace. Maybe there's some here tonight. Even. Maybe you know someone. You know, we've talked from time to a lot about the sanctity of life. When does life begin? I believe it begins in the womb. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. That at the moment upon conception, when however it is in there, when two cells form, merge inside the egg, that's God now has breathed life into that. He knew before it was even formed in the womb. God knows all things. That that life is precious. It was given by Him. We've talked about that first life. The sanctity and how we should be fighting for it. And and how we should be ministering to those. But let's talk about this just a second. We told a little humorous story at the beginning. Life really begins when your kids leave home and the dog dies. <laughs> you really start enjoying yourself. Folks, let me tell you when life really begins for most people. Is it really does begin when you come to that knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right. Yeah, there is that first birth, and, and true life begins in the womb. But the second life, the true point of the second life does happen when Jesus Christ comes into your life. Remember, that's what Jesus talked about with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. When he was there with Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you get to heaven? What are you talking about, Jesus? He said, a must, man must be born again. What do you mean born again? Nicodemus said, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to climb up into my mother's womb and be born a second time? Even Nicodemus understood life came from the womb. Life was inside of that womb. Jesus told him, he said, now you must be born once of water and of spirit. Water. Mm -hmm. You ever heard when a woman's water breaks? You ever heard that the first life then would would be in the womb when we were born into this world. That's the first life. This is what we've been talking about, the sanctity of life, the, the life that God gives us even when we're still inside of our mother's womb. And you can take your hand and place it on a, a pregnant woman and you can feel that little baby inside their kicking. Mm -hmm. You can put it in one of them ultrasound machines and watch its little heartbeat. You can watch its little hands reach around them. Even see them get the hiccups. They can feel when it's sleeping, when it's scared, when it don't feel good, when it's happy. As even John the Baptist, when he was inside his mother's womb and got around Jesus, said he jumped for joy. Because he knew. He knew. That's the first birth. But then the second birth is that of spirit, the, the spiritual birth. You see, you have your carnal, your fleshly birth. That's appreciated, folks. Never take it lightly. You're only on this earth for a very short time. The Bible describes it as a faith. But your spiritual birth will be for eternity. See, there was a time you never was. But there'll never be a time you are not. You will always be somewhere. When you die, you're either going to go to one or two places. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Your soul will live for eternity. And if you've not been born but one time with that fleshly birth, 
then without stutter, stammering, or apology, black print on white paper, I must inform you, if you have only had the fleshly birth and never been born again in Jesus Christ, friend, you will go to hell. All right. Your sins have not been paid for. That's why it's so important that we understand that second birth. Amen. Mm -hmm. The sanctity of life that comes in that. The sanctity of life in that can only come through death. The death of Jesus Christ. And it's so sad that these abortions happen, but you know what? There's a lot of people that the only way that they come to Jesus Christ is after they've experienced something horrible as this, and that God would then touch their hearts and save them. Because what people have meant for evil, God will use always for good. They meant evil when they crucified His Son. But God used it for good to pay for your sins. That when He died, you could be born of the Spirit. You could have a spiritual birth of being born again. Born into God's wonderful family. Becoming a child of His. Well, one day we will be with Him in heaven and you will see all these babies that lost their lives. You see, because folks, Jesus came to pay for sin. He, he paid for sin when He was on that cross. And let me give you some comfort here about these little babies. Their sins were forgiven. Yep. You see, we are born sinners. Right. We are born into sin. It's not that they're innocent. They were born and inherited the same sin that Adam had, same sin you inherited. But folks, Jesus Christ paid for that sin. Amen. He paid for original sin for everybody. That's why when a little child dies, they go immediately <coughs> to heaven. Because that original sin had been paid for. But there comes a point of accountability. No man knows. When that point is, I don't know even when I reached it in my own life. I can't tell you again exactly. But there comes a point in your life where you now make decisions and you are accountable for your actions and you not only commit what was called original sin, but now you commit what is called personal sin, which must be forgiven. And the only way that it can be forgiven is by being born again. So I ask you this evening. Are you born again? Do you know somebody maybe that's experiencing these issues? Maybe they're struggling with homosexuality and they're just scared to talk about it. Maybe they're scared that you'll reject it. Scared of what we would think about it. Folks, we still love them. We just hate their sin. Jesus Christ can renew and transform do you know somebody that's probably hurting? Maybe they've had an abortion. Maybe it was one of those rare cases where it was something that was medically necessary because it was life and death. But they're still hurting. Maybe you know somebody that had an abortion because they were young they thought they had made a mistake, but they made the true mistake when they had the abortion. Maybe there's somebody out there that you know of that you can go and minister to, that you know is hurting, this is going to give you a wonderful opportunity to go to them and show them the love of Christ. Show them what Christianity is all about. You know, I love all the things that we do. I love fellowship and I love gathering together. But you know what brings me the greatest joy in my Christian walk out of anything? Is when you see somebody that's hurting. Somebody that's been beaten down. Somebody that you know has been experiencing so much guilt upon them that they feel like the weight of the world is upon their shoulders. And you tell them about Jesus. And they believe on Him and they ask Him into their life and you see a renewing come about their spiritual... Uh, you see just they get a high pro glow. You see that they just have the biggest smile. You see it's just a new person. A new birth has arisen. That's the greatest joy I ever experienced when I lead some of the Lord. And I tell you what, I don't know how many I've done, but every time I get so nervous, so excited. Just like I am with my own children. You get so excited. You get nervous. It's the same way when you lead somebody to Christ because they've experienced the second birth. They've experienced that regeneration. 
doesn't that get you excited to go out and witness? Go out and visit somebody's home? Evangelize to those people? Knowing that their whole eternity may rest in the fact of you being obedient to the call of God and going and, and taking five minutes out of your busy schedule and stopping and say, you know what, I did stop by to check on you. I want to see if he was okay. Tell you God loves you. Would it be worth that out of your schedule? I know sometimes we get busy. But one day when we get to eternity, we really will have all the time in the world. And folks, I know there'll be no sadness and no pain in heaven. And I can't help but think, am I going to realize all those souls that I possibly could have reached? But it didn't. Because we thought we were too busy. We didn't realize the importance of it. People that we never reached out to to see and know just how much they were hurting and we had the key to give them relief. Key, Jesus Christ. I wondered that. And I bet you've wondered that too. And I bet God has called me and you. And He's speaking to your hearts right now. He's not just been speaking right now. He's been speaking to you for a long time. And now is the time in your life that you feel that, you know what, you're right, I'm going to surrender to God on this one because I, I understand what's happening right now is a, a, a time, of, it's one of those momentous times in history. It's one of those times in history of a turning point, a new chapter, something's fixing to happen. And it's time now that we rise up as a church and we awake from our slumber and we go and we wake up and we start diligently working while there's still light because night is coming. Are you waking up? Are you ready to get to work on the kingdom? Are you ready to live for Jesus, not just in the church, but outside? Are you ready to live for Jesus in the workplace? Are you ready to live for Jesus in the home? For your family, your loved ones, your neighbors, your community? Do you feel Jesus calling? Tenderly? Softly? Sweetly calling? you do tonight, I hope you will respond. But I can promise you that if by faith that you will come and step out and say, here I am. Maybe you're scared just like Jeremiah. Who am I? I can't speak. I can't do these things. And if you'll have that faith to step out tonight, you may hear that same voice that Jeremiah heard. You tell them, I am sick. Because I am. He is the great God. All powerful and all known. Tonight be the night He touches your mouth. Puts His words inside of you. And you can go boldly, proudly, and privileged professing His profane, glorious, holy word. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Your heavenly Father.